song number 346. Three forty six, people of the living God. Good evening. Welcome you again in Jesus' name. Uh, this is our fourth and final evening at uh, Winter Bible School, and Wendell Heat will be sharing tonight about mode of baptism. This is uh, specifically talking about our Anabaptist heritage and how we came to that position. I'd like to begin with prayer. Lord Jesus, we just uh, invite you to be here tonight. We ask for your direction and that you would superintend over everything tonight. Help us to learn and listen and Pray for your anointing on Wendell also as he leads out in Jesus' name. So for a short devotional, I invite you to turn with me to James 2. And hopefully I won't be stealing Wendell's fire for baptism tonight, but I wanted to just think about that a little bit. Um, it was... 1 Peter 3, 21 says that baptism now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so I just kind of think about what baptism is and yeah. So this passage um, explains that baptism is an outward reality or outward action resulting from an internal reality, something that happened inside, right? Um, so in our case, it was it's the pledge of a good conscience toward God. Um, that's the internal re reality. So I'd like to take just a few minutes to kind of think about that idea um, that our works are a response to an internal change, maybe especially in contrast to our works being an end of itself. Um, so that's where I wanted to jump in here in James chapter 2. Uh, there's, I'm kind of trying to only cut out the middle part of this section here and if we start here in verse 18 uh, but I'll read here 18 to 24 but someone will say you have faith and I have works 
Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one. You do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness, and he was called a friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. So I, I shared this passage because I think this is another one of those North Star um, scriptures for Anabaptists. And maybe it's, it's um, this idea of how we think about works has differentiated us from some of our extended Christian family, if you will. Um, that was even obvious in the days of the Reformers. Um, Martin Luther is famous for having called James the Book of Straw. And I'm not sure, maybe it was this passage that he was reacting to especially. Um, and, and this is where, if I can brag a bit about our, our way of understanding um, the Bible and salvation, is that um, I think that we as Anabaptists have perhaps done a better job at understanding that um, and, and living out the idea that ex, that's explained here in this passage, that a new birth will always result in outward holy, uh, holy living outwardly. And this passage makes it clear that it's misunderstanding faith if we say that you can be a believer without changing your works. And so this commitment to like holy living, like the outward working of our faith, um, is something that is part of my her- church heritage that I'm proud of and I don't want to lose. I think that's important. Um, but right with that, I think we should also make sure that we don't confuse what right living with a changed heart. Um, and I believe that scripture is clear that you can do all the right things, but inside you can still be full of dead man's bones. And that's a direct quote from Jesus, right? So, um, and that, that might be a ditch that we as plain people are especially tempted with um, because we do well at our outward works. Um, and our enemies, uh, if I'm quoting John, First John, are, you know, the world, the flesh, and the devil, all three of those, are actively trying to make us fall into one of those ditches. Um, and the two ditches that I'm talking about is um, the ditch of unholy living that we can sometimes fall into if we think, well, it just doesn't matter what I do because my heart's changed. So that's one ditch. And then the other ditch is, well, as long as I do the right things, it doesn't matter what's inside my heart. Um, yeah. And both of those are wrong, and I think that maybe Satan and or enemy, they don't really care which ditch we fall in as long as we're in one of the ditches. Um, but here we see that true, yeah, true faith produces works. It goes both ways. We, we both have the internal heart change of the new man that comes when Jesus comes in our life. Uh, and then there is always, a, if, if there is true change, there will always be um, holy living as a result of, of Jesus coming into our hearts. And that, as I talked about last night, that is the, the good works that are produced is what is one of the ways God intends to bring himself glory. Um, and he gets a lot of glory, apparently, um, for that. So just to close with uh, verse 26, for as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. And so may God bless you as you seek to bring him glory this week. All right, so we're going to, for the rest of the evening, we're going to follow the same kind of format as we had before. Um, There'll be a children's class, and I'd like to invite all the children up here. Craig will be leading out for this, and I'm just going to make sure you know that any, all ages are allowed to come up, or maybe especially the youth, feel free to come up. I think it's going to be probably worth your time to be within seeing distance. And then uh, we did have one question about the offering. We had an offering last night. And if you still wish to contribute uh, to Wendell, you can give that to John Lewis. And then uh, immediately following the children's class, we'll be taking, turning the time over to Wendell, and uh, then there'll be a closing song at the end. So we'll turn it over to you, Craig.
All right, okay, well, it is good to be here tonight on the final night of uh, Winter Bible School. Tomorrow night, you won't be here. Okay, well, today I have a verse from Psalms. Uh, we are, this is going to be our Bible memory verse for the night, and I'm going to be talking about working together as a team. Here in this verse, it talks about it as unity, or dwelling together in unity. That means working together as a team. So, if you adults could help us, and let's say this verse all together, let's say it two times, okay? Psalm 133.1, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. One more time. Psalm 133.1, Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. I know you guys aren't in school right now, but I'm going to give you a real quick math problem to figure out. Okay? Charlie can pull 8,000 pounds by himself. Bailey can pull 8,000 pounds by herself. How many pounds can they pull if they are harnessed together? Okay. Each one can pull 8,000 pounds by themselves. How much will they be able to pull when you put them together? We're going to come back to that at the end. Okay. Save your answer. So I already told, told you what I'm talking about, but here in 1 Corinthians 12, um, we see how a body of people or church have many different parts to them, okay? We have some boys and we have some girls and we have older and younger. We have uh, people with many different talents. Some people are the prayer warriors where they spend lots of time praying. And other, time, other times we have people who give sermons and they're the pastors and there's all different skill sets within a church. And when everybody can work together, it's a beautiful, beautiful thing, and you're able to actually do more when you work together, okay? All different parts working together as one team. I think all of you have been in a team, maybe in recess, and does not work that well if when you're playing basketball or some other team game and you try to do it all yourself? It generally doesn't work that well. In this passage here, uh, it's talking about the body and the hand and the eye. Uh, but basically it's saying, uh, if the foot would say, because I'm not a hand, okay? Maybe this foot wants to be a hand. I do not belong to the body. That would not make it le any less part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, okay? That would not make it any less part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, okay, well, for one, if a whole body would be a giant ear, that would not look that good, right? Can you imagine just a big old ear walking around? Okay. Where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, okay? Another word for this could kind of be like a team. Each one of them, as he choose, chose, if all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. Okay? So you see how this is working out here. There's many, many different people, many different talents and characteristics, character traits. And when you can all work together in one unified group, you're actually able to do more. Okay? Now, I'm using the word team. What are some teams that you guys might be part of? Anybody know? A group of people that you belong to. Anybody have any answer? Mennonites, Mennonites yes, we are Mennonites. Everybody that's Mennonite, uh, we are one team, and so we can work together with them. Any other teams? Think about, yeah. Family, it's a great one, okay? That's a team that you're part of. And when you don't play your role, it affects the rest of the people. Okay? So we have families, we have uh, Mennonites, we have school, your class at school. That's a great team. Sunday school. Even this church, did, we, did you know that this church as a whole body needs you? Okay? 
it would be kind of boring without any of you in church. Okay, so did you know that you are actually a part of the team of church? Isn't that kind of cool to think about? We need you, even if you think you're younger. We all need it, and we all have a part to play. Every single one of you, even though you have different gifts. Okay? And like I said before, the rest are going to suffer if you don't play your part. Okay? Even though we all have our different talents, our different characteristics. Okay? I brought some eggs along tonight. And we're going to say this guy's name is Bob, okay? just because it's a typical name. Okay? This is Bob. And Bob likes to do things himself. Kind of like us sometimes, right? We like to do things ourselves sometimes. And he's actually a pretty talented guy. He is good at sports. He can sing well. He does good at school. He has lots of friends. But as he gets older, he tries to continually do life without himself. And it doesn't always work that well. Sometimes Bob would be better off if he would ask for help or if he would help others. Okay? He's trying to do life on his own, and eventually, when enough pressure comes, he's going to go like that. Okay? He wasn't able to take all of the pressure. Okay? And I think that's how it is sometimes for us, too. Sometimes we are better off with others around us, whether that's a brother or a sister or a friend or maybe a school teacher or your parents, or maybe even another person in the church. We're all operating together as one team, and there's other people here that want to help you out. So here we have a team, okay? This is a whole team of people. They are unified. They all look kind of the same. I did not draw pictures on each one of these eggs, but perhaps this is how it would look if I would have, okay? They're all one team. Uh, maybe this would be a family or a school class, okay? Different people, they all look a little bit different. They all kind of look a little funny, right? But they all look a little bit different, but they're all operating together as a team, okay? So what do you think? Do you think this, these team, this team down here is going to be strong? Do you think it's going to be strong enough that it can actually hold me? No. Okay, let's give it a shot. Now, we hope this doesn't, don't go home and do this and end up with a bunch of eggs on your floor. Okay. Okay. Is it on the crystals or the eggs? I'm on the eggs and none of them are breaking. Okay. It's strong enough that when it works together, when they all are working together, they're actually able to hold me. Okay? Isn't that kind of impressive how that works out? Okay? Does, do any of you want to come up here and stand on them? Okay. I'm going to help you get on them just a little bit, okay? There you go. All right, isn't that kind of cool how when they all work together as a team, they were actually able to hold the weight of both of us. Okay. So back to our horse. How many pounds do you think Bailey and Charlie can pull if you put them together? 16,000. 16, That's a great guess. Anybody else? 16,000? Okay, okay, there we have another answer. What do you say? 16,000, that's a great answer because it's 8,000 plus 8,000, that's 16, right? You're doing your math right, but unfortunately that's actually the wrong answer. Did you know that when you put Bailey and Charlie together, they can pull up to 24,000 pounds? That's about the weight of what three horses should be doing, right? And did you know if you put Bailey and Charlie, if they grew up together, and if they trained together, they could actually pull up to 32,000 pounds, just the two of them. Okay. Isn't it kind of the same way in our, in our classes? 
and in our families and in our churches, when we're all unified, when we're all working together for the same cause, we're actually able to do more. And sometimes that takes training together, okay? Where we're actually maximizing how much we can get done and how much we can honor and glorify the Lord because that's what the, the point really is. Okay? We, and here's the thing. You might think that working together as a team is only for you guys. But let me tell you a secret. Sometimes adults need to work together too, okay? You will never, ever need to stop working together as a team. In fact, sometimes I think the adults don't always do as good of a job as children sometimes, okay? I said that, okay? We always need to work together as a team, no matter how old you are, no matter if you're five years old or 10 years old, or whether you're 60, 70, or 80 years old. We always have a group that we can be working together with to be honor, honoring and glorifying the Lord. Let's say this all together two more times. Psalm 133, 1. Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. One more time. Psalm 133, 1. Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Let's make sure that as we go home, we're going to have a good example to do that tonight when you're at your house, to dwell together in unity, to work together as a team, to work along with your parents and your brothers. And as you go to school tomorrow, you have another example where you're going to be part of your class and your school. And it's a good chance for you to work together in unity. All right, as you go back to your seats, how about we just all sing the first verse of when we all work together. You guys are dismissed. When we all work together, work together, work together. When we all work together, how happy we'll be. When your work is my work and our work is God's work. When we all work together, how happy we'll be. Well, as I begin this evening, I want to tell you how much uh, Naomi and I have enjoyed being here with you all. It has, you have certainly enriched our lives, and so we're, we're grateful for that. And I also want to thank Alfie and Teresa for the cozy apartment. It's even cozier than our house at home. And uh, that little electric fireplace has been appreciated. This topic this evening lends itself to some tedium. Uh, the, the nature of the talk, when I first gave it, it seemed kind of tedious, and I, I went through and tried to help it out today, but um, if we get partway through and, and it seems tedious to you, I, I don't have any peanut M&Ms to make you happy. You just have to go rely on your own Christian maturity and Christian graces to make it through. But we do want to talk about this matter of the mode of baptism. And when we talk about the mode of baptism, we're talking about the way the baptismal water is administered. You know, to boil it down to the crux of the matter, is the water placed on the person or is the person put into the water? In Sunday morning's uh, talk on nonconformity in Anabaptist history, I read a short excerpt uh, uh, from the Chronicle of the Hutterian Brethren about the first Anabaptist uh, baptism, first Anabaptist baptism, and I want to read that again. And as I read that, think about what it 
reveals or implies about the first Anabaptist baptism, I believe it was January 1, 1525. After prayer, George Blaurock stood up and asked Conrad Grubble in the name of God to baptize him with true Christian baptism on his faith and recognition of the truth. With this request, he knelt down and Conrad baptized him. Then the others turned to George in their turn, asking him to baptize them, which he did. How was the baptism performed? What was the mode of baptism? Well, according to this record, the initial baptism among those who were disparagingly called rebaptizers or Anabaptists must have been by effusion, which comes from the Latin to mean uh, to pour on, or by aspersion, which again comes from the Latin, which means to sprinkle. Now, we may wonder which it was. Was it by pouring or was it by sprinkling? along with the question of whether early Anabaptists also practiced immersion. And so, what does the historical record reveal? But before we go there, let me say this, that the way the early Anabaptists did it, while important, is not of greatest importance. The greatest importance is what we would learn from Scripture. Nevertheless, uh, the early Anabaptists understood uh, what their understanding and what their perspective was is important uh, for us to think about. It's instructive. It's hard for us to read Scripture totally fresh. Uh, we, we already have been, you know, through our backgrounds, through different influences, we, we come to the Scripture already influenced in some way. And generally that's good. Uh, but we may come to the Scripture influenced by what evangelicals say, which may not be bad. Uh, but let's just remember, we, we go to the Scripture and we are already have some preconceived ideas in our minds uh, or some teaching in our minds. And so let's understand uh, what the Anabaptists understood and understand what their perspective were and not just be evangelicals. Uh, I get instruction from them as well, but we, we are Anabaptists. Let's see what our heritage is. So what did the early Anabaptist uh, Mennonite history on uh, the matter of, of baptism, of how the baptism was administered? Let's look about that. So we just read about the very first Anabaptist baptism, four days after the first baptism. This would be on January 25. There was a Hans Brugbach who was baptized by Felix Mons uh, in Zolikon, which was near Zurich. The first baptisms took place in Zurich. And so it's, Mons took a metal dipper, as was used in a typical kitchen at that time, and he poured water over Mr. Brubach's head and said, I baptize you in the name of the Father, of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And then less than four months later, on Easter Day, and for three days following, Balthazar Humeir baptized 300 adults using water from a milk pail, which had been placed on the church's baptismal fund. Now this man uh, is a little bit of, a, of an outlier in terms of Anabaptist. He was Anabaptist. Uh, he was martyred at an early early stage, and he was trying to reform a church, and so that's probably why there were so many people uh, baptized uh, at that time. Uh, he was not uh, non-resistant, and uh, I think I said something about that earlier. Uh, I don't know whether he would have come to that position or not, but, but when this Anabaptist movement started, it wasn't that everybody had the same idea. You know, uh, and that's kind of a controversy in Anabaptist studies today. Who really were the Anabaptists? Well, on one hand, the Anabaptists was everybody who was rebaptized, but the ones who ended up being it was just like you have these different streams going out. Eventually, a certain uh, understanding coalesced and came together, and we could say that those are our more direct spiritual uh, forefathers, and some of these others just kind of dried up. Well, I kind of went on a rabbit trail there. Uh, so he baptized 300 people 
uh, using water from a milk pail. And so what this indicates is that it was not immersion. It does not say, though, whether it was actually uh, sprinkled or poured. Now, the question is, did early Anabaptists also baptize by immersion? Well, there's a record that also on April of uh, 1525, Conrad Greville baptized several hundred people in the Sitter River near St. Gall. And there's no information of whether um, it was by sprinkling or by pouring or by, by immersion. Uh, it doesn't specify how that was. However, in the previous year, in 1524, and that was before the actual official, uh, before the rebaptism started taking place, uh, Conrad Grebel had written something, and he specifically uses the phrase poured over with water in referring to baptism at Pentecost. And so I'll quote what, um, what he said. He said, they were thereafter poured over with water, meaning that just as they were cleansed within by the coming of the Holy Spirit, so they were all, so they all were poured over with water externally to signify for the inner cleansing and dying of sin. And so even though he baptized in the river, there's indication that he thought of baptism in terms of pouring over with water. Now there's a controversial and a questionable account of those early days of the movement in which one enthusiast wished to be uh, poured over with water from a dish but taken altogether naked into the Rhine by a grebel and pressed under and covered over. It reminds me of when Jesus wanted to wash Peter's feet and he says, no, not just my feet but my hands and my head. And this fellow didn't want to just be baptized a little bit. He wanted to be baptized uh, in, his, in, a, in, a, in a serious way. Now, Given the ferment and the upheaval and the fervor of that early movement and, and what was going on, this is not altogether impossible to have happened. However, this was written sometime after the fact, and it was written by someone who actually was opposed to the Anabaptists. And so, you know, it's, it's entirely possible that somebody took an event, embellished it or, or, or whatever, and used it as an error uh, as a club against the Anabaptists. And so that can only have carried so much weight. Even if that account was true, that he was immersed, it's an outlier to the historical evidence of the general practice. Harold Bender, who was a, a significant Mennonite historian, he died about 1961 uh, in through there, but he said this, uh, and he was uh, editor of, of the Mennonite Encyclopedia, there is no other evidence of the practice of immersion in Anabaptist history anywhere. And that statement was made or published in 1955. A study published in 1966 cast a little doubt on that statement, and we'll, we'll notice that in a little bit. But some people within the larger Anabaptist movement uh, were taken up with a with a strong end-time perspective on current events. When I say larger Anabaptist movement, I mean some of these people that were a little more outliers, but they were rebaptized, and so in one sense we include, include them in. And one of these men's name was Hans Hutt. He, lived, uh, he was South German, and he saw baptism as an end-time seal. In other words, he, he was given to apocalypticism he was given to end time things and he saw this was an end time seal in accordance with with um, revelation 7 verse 3 and i'll read that verse i hope i have my reference right saying hurt not the earth neither the sea nor the trees till we have sealed the servants of our god in their foreheads and so this man uh, supposedly would take a, a container of water and he'd use either his two fingers or his thumb and he would baptize or seal by, by means of making the sign of the cross on the forehead. Now, 
Roland Armour, who did a doctoral dissertation on, and it was a doctoral, a, a study for a doctor's degree on Anabaptist baptism, and he is the source of some of the information that I've got, also says that Hans Hutt seems simply to also have, have, have poured water in baptism as well. Now, another one of these apocalyptic men was uh, Melchior Hoffman, and he was a person who uh, carried Anabaptism up into Holland, up into what we call the Low Countries, the countries that were closer to sea level, were, were in, in the north of, of Germany, uh, or Germany goes into the north as well. And in my reading, I see him as more of an, Anab an Anabaptist Lutheran. He basically, in, in many ways, was Lutheran in his orientation, but he was rebaptized. And so we include him in. He has something to do with Dutch Anabaptism. And he really, we don't have record much of his, of his, um, of his baptism. However, according to one account, he baptized 300 people in Emdom in 1530, and it was done publicly in the church and they were performed out of a barrel. Now, I'm assuming he didn't dunk each person down into the barrel, but he took the water from the barrel to baptize these 300 people. Another Anabaptist yet that I want to make mention of is Pilgrim Mark Peck, and he was from present-day Austria. And he said this of baptism, and you'll notice in here is that contradiction, possible contradiction to what Harold Bender said, that there was no immersion uh, to take place among Anabaptists. And this is what he said. In summary, we can say that baptism is immersion in or effusion. And, and let me stop here. Sometimes the word effusion, uh, people who are writing about baptism, while it technically means pouring, sometimes they use it in the general sense of either pouring or sprinkling. And so uh, it's a little ambiguous. But I'll read again. In summary, we can say that baptism is immersion in or effusion with water, which the baptizand receives, desires, and accepts as a sign or co-witness that he has died to sin, has been buried with Christ, and is hereby raised to life. Now, Marpeck didn't leave any description of how baptism was really supposed to take place. But this excerpt from his writing indicates that perhaps he found immersion to be acceptable. Uh, and while that may be so, the person who did the study in this book and, and studied Anabaptist baptism thinks that Marpeck must have preferred pouring to immersion. Final example I want to give from Anabaptism is the Hutterite leader, Peter Raderman. And in describing the manner of baptism, he says, The baptizer tells him, in other words, the one being baptized, to humble himself with bent knees before God and his church and kneel down, and he takes pure water and pours it upon him. So, just in this little survey, other than a couple possible examples, it seems like that Anabaptist general practice, uh, early Anabaptist general practice, was uh, pouring or, or sprinkling. Uh, one person, a man by the name of R.S. Rayburn, he wrote uh, about modes of baptism in the Evangelical Dictionary of Theology, and he said this, the early Anabaptists, as a rule, baptized by pouring. Well, if that's the case, why did they pour instead of immerse? Was it because of conviction, or was it because of convention? In other words, was it out of principle, or was it out of uh, some practical way of doing it. Why, why did he do it? Uh, again, Harold Bender says that Roman Catholicism at the time of the Reformation, their baptism was generally by pouring or by sprinkling. And uh, an online Encyclopedia Britannica in an article on Roman Catholicism uh, supports that. Now, I don't know whether the Catholic priests or the Lutheran and Reformed pastors used their hands or whether they used some form of dipper or whether they used some sort of sprinkler. I'm not sure what they used, 
But my hunch is that the Anabaptists, at the time they started baptizing, did not baptize. They, they used the general practice that other people were using. Uh, you can study that and contradict that if you want to, but that's my hunch, that when they started baptizing, well, they just baptized like other people were baptizing, and other people were probably baptizing either by, by pouring or by sprinkling. The mode of baptism doesn't seem to have been a significant issue to them. They were more concerned that it be believer's baptism than exactly how the water was put on. One of the seven articles in the Schleitheim Confession that I've made reference to already was about baptism, and it says absolutely nothing about how the water is to be put on. And I'll read that section. It says, notice concerning, or at least an excerpt from it, notice concerning baptism, baptism shall be given to all those who have been taught repentance and amendment of life, and who... Believe truly that their sins are taken away through Christ and to all those who desire to walk in the resurrection of Jesus Christ and be buried with him in death so that they might rise with him to all those who with such an understanding themselves desire and request it from us. Hereby is excluded all infant baptism, the greatest and first abomination of the Pope. For this you have the reasons and the testimony of the writings and the practice of the apostles. We wish simply, yet resolutely, and with assurance to hold to the same. And so it talks about baptism. It talks about infant baptism. It, it talks about believer's baptism, but it doesn't talk about how to baptize. And that's the same way with the Dortrich Confession of Faith. And I don't know whether you all use the Dortrich Confession of Faith or not, but some churches still do. Uh, and that Confession of Faith uh, was a peace agreement made between... Uh, former opponents, and it was in the 1600s, I believe. And it talks about baptism, and again, it doesn't say anything about how baptism is, is supposed to take place. All right, we've talked about the Reformation, uh, about Anabaptist baptism. Let's back up a little now. Uh, in fact, we'll go back all the way up to the New Testament, and I don't want to spend uh, much time... Uh, but we're going to talk about pre-Reformation history of, of baptismal mode. You see, is this getting a little tedious? But, I mean, it's the nature of the subject, and so that's, that's what we're doing. Uh, so I want to make a few general statements about the New Testament period rather than taking the time to, to go through uh, a, a lot of New Testament material. But Jesus... Jesus' instruction to baptize, given just prior to his return, when he says uh, that we're to make disciples of all people, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things. And so he tells them how to do it, or he tells them to do it, but he doesn't tell his disciples how to do it. Apparently they knew how to do it, and he didn't say exactly how it should, should be done. And similarly, on the day of Pentecost, and so I want to go there to Acts chapter 2. On the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit uh, was poured out on, on the believers, and Peter preached, and 3,000 were saved. Then it says in verse 30, 41, Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day, and the same day, there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Again, no record of how the water was put on or whether they were put into the water. But they were in Jerusalem. And so it does raise the question, how do you baptize 3,000 people in a day in the city of Jerusalem uh, of, of that time? It doesn't say. But in fact, nowhere does the New Testament specifically spell out how that, uh, about the mode of, of, of baptism, how the water is, is to be applied. Rather, uh, appeals to the Bible for both immersion and for pouring come from inference. In other words, what, what the Bible implies, what you understand the setting to be of what happened there, rather than, than a direct teaching of what it should be. And so we go to Acts chapter 8, 
And there is about Philip and the Ethiopian. And so in verses 38 and 39, uh, as they were going along, and then, uh, you know, the Ethiopian says, well, you know, what hinders me from being baptized? And then it says in verse 38, and when he commanded the chariot to stand still, and he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord called him away. Okay, so they went into the water, they came up out of the water. And so those who embrace immersion would use this to infer that, well, they must have been immersed. But then we go over to chapter 10, where Peter was in Cornelius' house. And it says in um, verse 47 and 48, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. And they prayed him that he would tarry certain days. And so how did the baptism, baptism take place there? Uh, you know, was there a bathtub or, or what was it? And so you, you, bound, you, you have chapter 8. Those who, who want to emphasize immersion says, well, he went down to the water. This implies that it probably took place in the house in chapter 10. And so nowhere does the New Testament just really spell it out. Now, moving beyond the New Testament, one piece of evidence on the mode of baptism is found in a, in a thing called the Didache. The Didache is a Greek uh, handbook uh, Uh, a Greek handbook, uh, I know it's in the Greek language, on in, of instruction in morals. It's kind of like uh, uh, it talked about church order and it talked about, uh, uh, you know, maybe it was, it was a more like a, an instruction book or something. Give, in other words, give, give a, a, a kind of a, of a rules and discipline sort of thing, perhaps. But anyway, it was something that gave instruction on church order. And it consisted of 16 four short chapters. And it was lost for centuries. And it was found in a library in Constantinople, which is today Istanbul in Turkey, uh, in 1878. So this thing had been, uh, and the copy they found was actually dated in uh, 10,056. And so it's uncertain when this document was actually uh, developed this handbook or whatever of church life, uh, church order, and uh, whether it's in the first to the third century. But I just want to read a section in this thing about baptism. Now about baptism, this is how to baptize. Give public instruction on all these points and then baptize in running water in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. If you do not have running water, baptize in some other. If you cannot in cold, then in warm. If you have neither, then pour water on the head three times in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, this is often interpreted as a, uh, in favor of immersion with pouring being an alternate, uh, an acceptable alternate. And while that's plausible, it's possible, I also find this confusing. You know, if you were to follow these instructions, well, really, what would you do? You know, I, it, it seems uncertainly and additionally we don't really know uh, when this became in use in the church or even how broad of an area it represented was this just something that a couple churches did or was this common practice over many churches um, well further evidence for the use of, of immersion in in uh, earlier church life I found in a Wikipedia article on the history of baptism, and it states that um, uh, talks about triple immersion in uh, 895, the year 895, and it also talks about that facilities, there were facilities in church buildings that uh, indicate that immersion was practiced in the Middle Ages. In other words, there was a baptistries like, uh, you know, like uh, a tub and you know, where, where someone could actually be 
uh, baptized by immersion. Now, again, you, you don't know whether, uh, whether it really was used or whether it was just a container of water. For instance, in the temple, they had a huge container of water sitting on the back of, what was it, 12 oxen. And so, well, there wasn't immersing people in that, in that tank of water. That was just a, a tank of water to have plenty of water there for the needs of the temple. And so were these tanks in the churches holding water or were they used to put people into? And that would be a question to, to raise. Um, infant baptism must have been occurring at least in the second century that would be in the 100s uh, already starting to do infant baptism and uh, I wonder I wonder uh, how this affected the mode of baptism I wonder if infants were baptized differently than adults uh, if the church was immersing during those years were they baptizing infants by sprinkling or pouring and were they baptizing adults that would, uh, were converts or that were Christianized with, with pouring? I don't know. It's, it's a question to raise. Again, from uh, an encyclopedia, encyclopedia article on the history of baptism, in the period between the 12th and the 14th centuries, a fusion became the usual manner of administering baptism in Western Europe, though immersion continued to be found in some places as late as the 16th century, which would have been the century, the 1500s, the, the century that Anabaptism started. Now, part of the historical record is not just what is written down, but it is, it is paintings. And so uh, there are some baptisms, or were, that were recorded in an underground network of rooms called the catacombs. Now, the catacombs were an underground network of rooms that was used for, for burials, uh, particularly uh, by Christians and by Jews, and also Christians sometimes worshipped down underground in these tunnels, so to speak, these underground rooms. And there was a Mennonite minister and widower by the name of A.D. Wanger. He was born in 1867. He married a, a girl from, is it Millersville? That's here close by, close by um, uh, Lancaster. Uh, there were two significant people from here who were in, uh, in the Harrisonburg area. One was Chester K. Lehman, Lehman and he was involved uh, with Eastern Mennonite School and his, uh, for many years and, and the seminary, and the other was Daniel W. Lehman, his brother, uh, and he was a bishop and also a teacher at Eastern Mennonite College. And, uh, and it was their sister that was married um, to this A.D. Wanger, I think, as his second wife. But be that as it may, this man, he lost his wife early and not after he was married very long. And so he took the opportunity for a six-month tour uh, around the world. And he wrote about it in a book, Six Months, or maybe it took longer around the world, but he wrote this book called Six Months in the Bible Lands. And in there he tells about an experience, and his experience is summarized in a book by J.C. Wanger uh, called Introduction to Theology. And this is this is what... Uh, the story is that A.D. told his guide, take me to, to some pictures, uh, paintings of baptism in the, in the catacombs. And so the guide took him, and all these pictures of, the, of baptism were of pouring. And then he asked the guide to take him to some pictures that showed other modes of baptism. And the guide said, well, there were no other modes represented in these pictures. Also, the historian Philip Schaff uh, said that it is remarkable that in almost all the earliest representations of baptism that have been preserved for us, the pouring of water from a vessel over the body is the special act represented. And so another quote again from this 
R.S. Rayburn in the Evangelical Dictionary of Theology, he said that the earliest artistic representations depict baptism by pouring. One recent writer summarized the early church period by saying, the church most likely practiced full immersion, partial immersion, and pouring, a fusion, at various times and places in the early centuries, with sprinkling being practiced rarely during that time period. And I'm satisfied to leave it at that. There were probably different practices during the life of the church. Now let's move to North America. Mennonites began arriving in North America in 1683 in Germantown, and then 1710 or 11 here in Lancaster County. And then shortly after that, the Mennonites' spiritual cousins started coming, two groups, one in 1719 and one in 1729. And who were these people? Well, they were the Brethren, or the Dunkers, or German Baptists, as they were sometimes called. And so they first settled in Germantown as well, and then they came here to Lancaster County, and then they have you know, scattered, uh, went further west with the Mennonites. And uh, the uh, Brethren... The Brethren were formed in 1708 in Germany, both with Anabaptist and Pietistic influences. And when, when we say Pietistic, let's just think of it in this way. They were experience-oriented. Uh, and that is not totally wrong, but if you get too experience-oriented with not enough doctrine, uh, then, then you're, you become uh, very subjective in, in terms of, of your faith. And you can be, go up, and then the, the movement can also go down and fall apart. But they held to adult baptism as Mennonites, as Anabaptists did, but they held to immersion as the proper mode uh, very strongly, and some even to the point of insisting that a person could not be saved without immersion. My great-grandfather was Dunkard. He married an old order Mennonite, a horse and buggy Mennonite woman. They never did get their act together. He always remained Dunkard. She always remained old order. They had three girls and two boys. And of the three girls, one was old order Mennonite, one was Dunkard, and one was other type of Mennonite, who was my grandmother. Be that as it may, these people held to a very strong um, doctrine of, of immersion. And so as aggressive evangelists uh, and proselytizers, the, <clears throat> the brethren caused a lot of trouble for the Mennonites, convincing many of them to join uh, the brethren church. And in fairness, it may be that many Mennonites needed to be evangelized, that they really weren't saved. And so some of them may have joined the brethren church because of uh, because they uh, were convinced that immersion was the proper mode, and some of them may have joined the Brethren Church because they got saved and decided to join with the, with the Brethren. <clears throat> but whatever, um, a lot of people, were, a lot of Mennonites were joined um, to, to the Brethren Church. Now again, a personal story. My grandfather who married the lady I just was telling you about as my grandmother. My grandfather, when he was a little boy, there was a stream, uh, went through the, <clears throat> the pasture, uh, went through the, the, the farm where he grew up, and interestingly, that stream's name was, was Muddy Creek as well. So there's a Muddy Creek here in Lancaster County somewhere, and was a Muddy Creek there as well. <clears throat> and so I don't remember in details. I'll give the, the gist of, of what this goes. I may not say everything just right, but... But uh, he went out to watch this baptism. It was the brethren were having a baptism in Muddy Creek there in the pasture on the farm. And he was a little boy and went out to watch this. And I don't know whether the woman or the girl or whoever being baptized was a little unsure of herself or she was flailing around or he, or he was afraid they were going to drown her or what. And he all of a sudden hollered out, let that woman alone. And the preacher said, grab him. And he took off. Well... The first book by an American Mennonite author uh, was published in 1744. 
And it included a strong defense of the Mennonite understanding of, of practice uh, of the baptism. It, and it, was, it was a strong defense of Mennonite baptism against immersionists. Now, the author of that book was Henry Funk. Uh, the name of the book was A Mirror of Baptism of the Spirit with Water and with Blood. He was an immigrant, uh, and he was also an influential church leader. And then he wrote a, a revision, I suppose, or another book, a second, it was a larger book, and he died before it got published. But his, um, his children published it in 18, 1763 after his death, and by that time he had mellowed out a little bit. And in that book's preface, uh, Mr. Funk said that Christians should not divide over mere difference of understanding and form in the manner of things ceremonial. And so, uh, while he apparently still believed in pouring as the proper method, he, he backed off in terms of the, uh, what, the aggression uh, about that and thought there ought to be a little broader uh, charity about that. Now, Funk's great-grandson was this John Funk that I made reference to that lived in Elkhart, Indiana and started his Mennonite Publishing Company and uh, Herald of Truth magazine. And John Funk uh, lived from 1835 to 1930, and he was very pivotal in making uh, moving Mennonites from, um, from their... How do, I, how do I want to say this? From, from what team Mennonites more represent now to what Mennonites became. And I was, he was very pivotal in introducing uh, change such as uh, revival meetings and uh, Sunday schools and this sort, this sort of thing that caused a lot of controversy within the church. And, and so he, he, he was a, a figure in, involved in that. And he had this uh, business called Mennonite Publishing Company, and in time, uh, that became superseded by the Mennonite Publishing House. And the Mennonite Publishing House was not a for-profit business. It was, a, it was the publishing company of the Mennonite Church up in Scottsdale, uh, Pennsylvania. And one of the people also of, uh, of a mover and doer in, in the church was a man by the name of Daniel Kaufman. Daniel Kaufman grew up in Versailles, Missouri, and he, uh, he was into politics, but uh, anyway, he got saved. He said, uh, I think the story is that he said, I, I gave my hand to the evangelist and I gave my heart to the Lord. And he became editor of the Gospel Herald. I think maybe he was editor for 40 years. Which the Gospel Herald was the magazine of the Mennonite Church. But the more significant thing that he did in terms of something that is lasting is that he was editor of a book called Doctrines of the Bible. And Doctrines of the Bible, some of you may have it, some of you may use it. It was published in 1928, and it is still in print. And so he was one who kind of organized our understanding of doctrine. Mennonites, Anabaptists, their writings were not... Um, doctrinal books in the sense that you go there to see well what does the bible teach about the church or about man or about sin or about salvation the anabaptists they were on the run the early anabaptists they didn't have time to sit down and write except for men of simons uh, he had he was able to do that and there was writings but but uh in terms of organizing our belief into a systematic way a doctrinal way Daniel Kaufman was uh, instrumental in that. And so, in this book, The Doctrines of the Bible, it sets forth doctrinal and practical understandings, which I believe are current among Mennonites and, and probably uh, you as Beaches as well. And this is what he says. It will help us, help us to keep from becoming radical in our views of baptism if we remember that the exact manner of applying the water is nowhere stated in describing apostolic baptisms. Yet we should avoid the opposite extreme of indifference to Bible teaching on this subject 
For the Bible does give, a, does give us some teaching which throws light upon the proper mode of baptism. And then he goes ahead and he lays out five points under the heading of why we believe pouring is the Bible mode. And so you can go get doctrines of the Bible and read what he has to say. I consider John C. Wanger, J.C. Wanger, who was a teacher at Goshen College, uh, and he was a man that was in many, many ways uh, a conservative man, but he was kind of a hinge between what the church was and what the church became. And I think that he made the last definitive statement of, of our doctrine, our theology. And again, it is still in print. You can buy it from Rod Staff Publishers. I believe his book is called Introduction to Theology. And in there he spends, uh, uh, it was it published in 1954, and he dedicated over three pages to the mode of baptism. And he briefly reviews the case for immersion, and he acknowledges that immersion is effective. It works. You know, you can immerse. Uh, that that it is uh, something that is valid. But he justifies the validity of pouring, and he lists four or five points of why he thinks that that pouring is is valid. Now, John C. concludes that the basic fact remains, and I'm quoting, that the validity of a Christian ordinance does not depend upon its material form, but upon the spiritual attitude of the person receiving the ordinance. All right, now let's apply that, and I don't know if you can totally carry that across the board, but let's apply that to the head covering. He's saying the validity of the head covering is not whether it is the material form. It is not whether it is white or black or cap-styled or veil-styled or opaque or translucent. What makes it really valid is the heart of the person who is wearing the veil. Not that the shape of the veil or, or any of that is not important, doesn't have validity, but the real gist of the matter is what is the heart like? And so if a person's heart is right and they're making a serious attempt uh, to wear a, a veil, uh, you don't say that, oh, your veil don't qualify because it's cap style. Or your veil don't qualify because it's, because it's uh, limp or it's veil style or whatever. It's the heart that is the substance and the material form is not as important. And so applying that to baptism, what he's saying is that whether it is by immersion or whether it is by pouring, either one of those works. Uh, but what makes it work is where your heart is. where your heart is. And so if your heart is not right, well, neither one works. And so uh, he favors, I believe he favors pouring, but he says that that immersion is, is valid. I don't know what your practice is, but our practice is that if someone, so we pour, but if someone uh, comes to our church and wants to become uh, a member, and let's say they were from the Church of the Brethren, or they from from the Baptist, or whatever, where they were poured, or where they were immersed, we accept their baptism if their baptism was valid. We do not require a rebaptism. If they were baptized as infants, then they would be required uh, of a rebaptism. So I don't know what your practice is, but if we practice pouring but recognize immersion, we must agree that while one is to be preferred, both modes are effective. Now, I grew up and was baptized within the Virginia Mennonite Conference, um, and that conference assumed responsibility for mission work on the island of Jamaica in the mid-1950s. And the official birth of the Jamaica Mennonite Church was on Sunday, July 10, 1955. And on that day, 15 members uh, were received upon confession of faith and 11 by baptism. And the baptism took place in Kingston Harbor. Okay, this was 1955, and um, the district that left 
Virginia Conference and formed Southeastern Conference, of which then I became a part, was in 1971. So 1955, Virginia Conference was still somewhat, uh, you know, fairly conservative uh, for in, in many ways. I just want to set that in context. So they, they have this mission work, and they have uh, 11 people to be baptized, and the baptism held place in Kingston Harbor. Kingston is the capital of Jamaica, and it took place in an early morning service. My maternal grandfather was present uh, for the occasion. He was on the mission board. And there was a book written about the work in Jamaica, and he told my grandfather, uh, we called him Grandpa, he told the author of the book about, uh, uh, that wrote about that, he said that there was a Mrs. Taylor that was sick and couldn't go down to the harbor, so she came to the church and was baptized. So some people were baptized in the harbor, but she was sick for some reason and needed to be baptized at the church. And he said that, I'm sorry the woman was sick, but I was glad for that occasion to prove the adaptability of that mode of baptism, that it was universal. In other words, you could baptize in the harbor or you could baptize in the church. There's more to the story. Mrs. Taylor was baptized uh, by water cupped in hands. Now, when I baptize, I baptize with a pitcher. Uh, other people have baptized uh, cupping water in their hands, and I don't know what your all's practice is, and, and pouring the water uh, on, on the person's head. She was baptized with cupped hands. The people in the harbor were baptized with a bucket. And the author states, a compromise had been found, immersion by pouring. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your plan of salvation. And we thank you for the way that that is confirmed through baptism. Thank you that, that uh, you've devised a way in which we can declare that we identify with you and that we are Christian believers. Help us to be sensitive about the proper way to do this. Thank you for the provision of pouring. And uh, we recognize, I recognize the, the validity of immersion as well, but we pray, Father, that we would seek to do what's right and that our hearts would be right when we're baptized and that uh, we would live our life in your will. This we pray in Jesus' name, amen. I guess we'll have a song, or you will take over.